The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Yes, it's dark in here, but there is no need to be alone. I will be your friend. And on the subject of friendship, I'll give you some invaluable advice. The philosopher Delisle once said, chance makes our parents, but choice makes our friends. With that in mind, I advise you to choose your friends carefully. Do not make the mistake the young man in our story is about to make. He will choose foolishly and soon learn that one should not make the choice of a friend a matter of life or death. You can't keep us chained below decks forever. I'll pay you back for every lash of the whip. I swear I will. Shh. The guards, they'll hear you. Who are you? My name's Armitage. James Armitage. You're just a boy. What are you doing on this godforsaken convict ship? Penance, just as you are. Well, you will be doing it for a long. Huh? I'll be getting us all out of here, I will. How? Oh, leave that to me. The name's Hudson. Mark it well, lad. You'll learn to bless it before I'm done with you. Mystery drama, The Glorious Scott, was adapted from the Sherlock Holmes classic by Ralph Goodman, especially for the Radio Mystery Theater, and stars Kevin McCarthy. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Holmes looked upon the sea as a vast open expanse of hypnotic tranquility, a contrast to the wheels within wheels that turn the deductive turbine of his analytical mind. But the sea is not always tranquil. There are times of violence, and when the churning ceases, the open expanse buries its secrets, shrouding them from the eyes of man. It was a time such as this of which Sherlock Holmes' creator, A. Conan Doyle, speaks in this story, faithfully and fully depicted by the admirable Watson. Early in the winter of 1886, I was returning from a medical symposium, eager to see my good friend and companion, Sherlock Holmes. I soon found myself at the familiar door on Baker Street, my friend was obviously in the study playing on his violin. Holmes was a man of many talents. I decided not to disturb him and started upstairs to my room only to find my way blocked by the very friend I didn't wish to disturb. Watson, this is a surprise. <laughs> no greater than mine at, at seeing you coming down the stairs, Holmes. Well, your violin. Ah, coming from the den, of course. <laughs> but I, I don't understand. How, how is it possible? For me to be here on the stairs and in the den at the same time. Yes. Oh, all very simply explained. If you will follow me, Watson. Hmm. Now, take a look at the den. Well, it's empty. On the table, in the far corner. Oh, what a strange-looking contraption. Newly arrived from America, Watson. A gift of a dear friend. You remember Miss Adler? Oh, Irene Adler, mm -hmm. yes, of course. On a world tour with her new production, The Grand Deception. And as a token of her friendship, and perhaps to symbolize the play, she has sent me a working model of Mr. Edson's experimental voice recorder. Well... I merely substituted the violin for the voice. Gosh, you, you mean that music is, is coming from that little gadget? Yes, Watson. I went up the stairs to see how far the sound would travel, and I was just descending as you came in. Here, let me turn this off. Well, I, I say I... I am glad to be back. Oh, oh by the way, mm -hmm. I stopped off to pick up the post. 
Uh, there's a package here somewhere for you. Mm, yes, sir, I see, Watson. It's a small one. There's some circulars, advertisements, ah, my medical journal. A small one, Watson. Oh, why, yes, yes, so it is. And how did you know that? A oh. small one has been sent by registered mail. The one I've been expecting was to be sent by registered mail. Elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> You've been <laughs> expecting this parcel? Yes, Watson. Now, if you'll hand me those scissors, I'll snip this twine, and we'll have a look-see at the contents of the mysterious oblong box. Mysterious oblong box? Mysterious to the gentleman who first received it. He has asked me to have a look at it. Hmm. Interesting. A tarnished silver cylinder containing a single sheet of slate gray paper. Uh, there is something written on it. Bring the lamp a little closer, will you, Watson? Written by an old man, I should say. Wouldn't you, Holmes? Rather a feeble hand. Not feeble. Unskilled in the art of writing. There is a difference. Notice the spelling of the words believe and receive. The sender is unfamiliar with the simple rule of I before E except after C. But you are right about his age. Oh, well, I... Uh... In his fifties, I would say. Well, well, now, how would you know that? The style of penmanship, this form of calligraphy, went out of fashion 30 years ago. Oh, oh yes, 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 of course. <laughs> Can you make it out, Holmes? Mm -hmm. Yes, now that we have sufficient light, it says, Headkeeper Hudson, we believe, has now been told to receive all orders for flypaper and for the preservation of your hen pheasant's life. Yes, go on. That's it, Watson. The entire message? Mm, yes. Are you sure you read it correctly? Positive. Well, that is strange. Mm -hmm. Yes, doesn't seem threatening at all. I wonder why that worries my friend Trevor so much. An easygoing young man, not easily disturbed. Trevor? Uh, Victor Trevor? The young friend you introduced me to during your stay at college? That's the one. I met him accidentally one morning on my way to chapel when his bull terrier froze to my ankle. You recall the incident, don't you, Watson? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ridiculous. <laughs> the stubborn dog was determined to become your permanent companion. <laughs> uh, didn't seem amusing at the time. Laid me up for days. But Victor came around often to apologize, and by the end of the fall term, we'd become close friends. Oh, I hate to see a good friend in a dilemma. Victor's word enough about this package he received in the post to send it on to me just as he received it. He has no idea who sent it? Mm, not an inkling. Mm. Here enclosed is the original wrapping. No return address, which of course does not help to enlighten us as to the name of the sender. There is one small clue, however, conveniently provided by the Postal Service. Oh? Origin of mailing, place, time, date. Ah, uh, of course. <laughs> The postmark, yes. King's Cove, the 25th of last month, 10 a.m. King's Cove. Uh, I don't believe I've ever heard of it. Nor I, nor I. Perhaps it'll mean something to Victor Trevor. I think at best I pay that young man a visit. You're right, Holmes, yes. First thing in the morning, we leave for Donningthorpe in Norfolk. Can you make it? Well, I'll telegraph Victor and let him know we're coming. Bully for you, Watson. And if I can somehow decipher this innocent-sounding missive, I have a feeling that you and I won't be bored much longer. <laughs> Now we should reach our destination shortly, Watson. How are you bearing up under the journey? Oh, dear, oh, dear. <clears throat> as well as can be expected, Holmes. Mm. I do wish we'd waited for another carriage. I dare say this one's seen better days, I tell you, Holmes. It <laughs> wasn't for my curiosity over the contents of that tarnished cylinder. <laughs> oh, I say you did bring the cylinder and the message. Oh, yes, of course. Mm. Well... Have you made anything at all of all that gibberish? Working on it, Watson, working on it. Excellent. Mm. Ah, they're up ahead. We're being welcomed. See there? Beyond those manicured gardens, the Trevor Estate. I say, I had no idea young Trevor had such wealth. Family wealth. Victor's father, Sir James Trevor, is the lord of this manor. Victor lives with his father. 
Just the two of them in that spacious mansion? Mm -hmm. Three quarreling servants, as I recall. Hmm. Uh, this is getting more intriguing every moment. Uh, uh, hurry the driver along, will you, Holmes? Both my back and my curiosity can take it no longer. We were soon at the imposing entrance to Trevor Manor. Holmes and I stepped down from the carriage and moved toward the massive entrance door. It was made of solid oak, all neatly carved to a depth of at least two or eight inches, inlaid with sections of highly polished, impenetrable ironwood, obviously chosen with great care. And yet, I couldn't help wondering why a simple manor house had the appearance of a veritable fortress. Charles, Charles, how good to see you. Would you tell Mr. Victor that his guests have arrived? Holmes, Holmes, how good of you to come. Oh, you don't know how pleased I am to see you. And I, too, Victor, to see you. That's all right, Charles. I'll welcome them. You may prepare their rooms. Yes, sir. And uh, there's no need to disturb Father. I'll inform him of our guests' arrival after they're settled. As you wish, Mr. Victor. Come in, come in. This is my good friend and companion, Dr. Watson. I believe you two have met. Uh, we have? Briefly, when Watson came to examine my injury at college. Oh, yes, <laughs> that unfortunate incident. <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. When your bull terrier froze to Holmes's ankle on the way to chapel. <laughs> Ridiculous situation. Yes, those were happy days, weren't they, Holmes? Uh, happy for your bull terrier, I wager. <laughs> at any rate, uh, it's good to see you smiling. You looked so grim when we first entered. Did I? Mm. Oh, well, as you know, I have been concerned... About the package, it was sent to Father, actually, and I intercepted it. Uh, he hasn't been well. Oh, oh. Mister, whom are you conversing with? Do we have guests? Uh, yeah, yes, Father, distinguished guests. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes is here with his friend, uh, Dr. Watson. Sherlock Holmes. The Sherlock Holmes, the celebrated detective about whom one hears so much these days? You are much too kind, Sir James. Oh, yes, Sir James. You've heard about the recent honor bestowed upon me by the Crown. And deservedly so. You have been one of His Majesty's most distinguished jurists. Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, allow me to introduce my good friend, Dr. Watson. Uh, an honor, sir. I do hope our untimely arrival has not disturbed your rest. Untimely? Unexpected is more like it. Oh, I say. Uh, you did receive our wire, Victor? Uh, yes, I, I'm sorry. I neglected to inform Father. That... Uh, it doesn't matter. You are here, and I'll have Charles prepare your room. Uh, that's all taken care of, Father. I see. You can't wait to take charge here, can you, Victor? Father... Well, I'm not dead and gone yet. See to your guests. I have an important matter to attend to. If you will forgive me, gentlemen, I'll see you at dinner. Uh, let me help you to your room. Oh, leave me alone, Victor. I'll manage to stay alive without your help. Oh, dear. Feisty old gentleman, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Quite changed since I saw him last. I wonder what he's afraid of. He did have a strange look. Mm, did you notice his walking stick, Watson? Walking stick? Yes, had a rather unusual brass club head. Oh, nothing unusual about that, Holmes. I understand it's the latest fashion. True, but if you were to examine this one a bit more closely, you will find that Sir James has taken pains to bore the head and pour lead into the hole to make it a formidable weapon. Uh, gentlemen, I'll show you to your rooms. I uh, suggest we save all discussion about the packet and its contents for later after father has gone to sleep. Well, it seems Sherlock Holmes is not unfamiliar with the face of fear, having unmasked it on many a previous occasion. What will he find beneath the mask this time? We'll learn shortly when I return with Act Two. of the glorious Scott is one of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's most unusual tales. 
It is unique in that of all the tales of Sherlock Holmes, as recorded by his good friend, Dr. Watson, there is no other adventure in which fear proves to be as strong as death. And the mystery that shrouds that fear as silent as a grave. But it is best we let Watson continue with the story. That evening, we dressed for dinner, Holmes and I, in hopes of learning more about the packet Victor had sent to Holmes for his perusal. Our hopes were in vain, however, for during dinner, both Victor and his father remained silent. Holmes' attempt at chit-chat was failing miserably. Marvelous to know, Sir James. <coughs> yes. Yes, it'll do. Uh, I had almost forgotten the magnificent table you spread, sir. It's been some time since my visit here with you and your son. Yes, yes of course. Some time. Past the short lecture. You recall, Father, it was three summers ago we went fishing on the lake. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, Mr. Holmes doesn't have time for such frivolity these days. He's become quite a celebrated figure. Uh, we read about you all the time, Holmes. Oh, well, and uh, you've, you've read the account of the Hound of the Baskervilles, eh? Uh, if it wasn't for Holmes' amazing deductive powers... Yes, yes, the... yes, yes, Watson. <laughs> I'm sure Sir James is not the least bit interested. As a matter of fact, I found it all quite hard to believe. Father, I had those fabled deductive powers of yours, Mr. Holmes. Would you care to put them to a test? A test, sir? Here. Yeah. At the dinner table. Father, I'm sure Mr. Holmes is... Ah, I'd be pleased to oblige you, Sir James, but in order to perform my... Uh, I need a subject. May I use you, Sir James? Me? <laughs> Why not? But I must warn you. All my life I've been an island unto myself. We have spoken very little since your arrival here. There's no need for you to say anything. Your hands speak for you, Sir James. My hands? Yes, Outwardly, you are a landed gentry, and yet you have the hands of a laborer. Calloused, hard, worn in the days of your youth. True, I worked the gold mines as a boy. Mm, then you've been to Australia. Oh, yes, I've been to many a foreign port. Ah, uh -huh. then the initials J.A. belong perhaps to someone you met on a voyage, someone whom afterwards you were most eager to forget. <laughs> How could you possibly know about that? Forgive me, forgive me, sir. <coughs> Not until you tell me how much you know. Father, are you all right? Uh, his heart, Holmes. The doctor said no, that... No, damn that doctor. I've asked you a question, Mr. I Holmes. Know, I know nothing, really, sir. Only that during my sabbatical here, that day we went fishing on the lake, I saw the initials J.A. tattooed on your arm. Oh, sir. Yes, Watson. At the time, it struck me as being unusual, too, for a gentleman. But, but you said this J.A. person was someone Sir James was eager to forget. Well, on what did you base that conclusion? The staining of the skin around the letters, Watson. It was obvious from the blurred appearance of the tattoo that its wearer had tried but failed to eradicate the memory of J.A. I, I, I've heard enough. It is true. I once knew a J.A. But we will talk of it no more. But, Father, if you are in some sort of danger, Mr. Holmes here is a good friend. I'm sure he'd be more than willing to... Help. I said we will speak of this no more. Forgive me, Mr. Holmes, but the past is a closed chapter of my life. <coughs> Charles, you may serve the brandy now. None for me. Prepare my room. <coughs> if you'll excuse me, I'd best get to bed. Not that I'll sleep tonight. Of all the ghosts of the past, the ghosts of the sea are the worst. And so, once again, there was silence in the Great Hall. Sir James had retired, and we moved to the sitting room with our brandies. Ah, the warmth of the wine was most welcome. It helped stave off the chill brought on by Holmes' uncanny disclosures of Sir James's secret. As we sat there, each engrossed in his own thoughts, 
Holmes pressed his investigation further. And you say, Victor, that your father never spoke of his past to you? No, Holmes, your amazing deductions came as a complete surprise. The gold mines, the sea, I've seen the tattoo on occasion, but well, dismissed it as a folly of youth. Perhaps. But not likely, Holmes. Did you see the sudden flush? The advance of pulse rate at the mention of J.A. Mm. Sir James is not a well man. Her father refuses to see a doctor. He remains locked in the house in contact with no one. Except by mail, obviously. I say, was there a mention of anyone with the initials J.A. in that message you received in the post? No, I'm afraid not, Watson. The only name mentioned was someone named Hudson. Headkeeper Hudson, as I recall. Hudson? Then you know someone named Hudson. Yes, I do. I do know a Hudson, or did know him. Think, Victor. Now, this could be most important. The man I refer to had no title. Certainly was not responsible enough to be a head keeper. He was a common sailor. A sailor? Interesting. This could possibly lead us to the sea and to the initials J.A. Yes. Go on, Victor. Well, well, one morning after Holmes' visit here on holiday, Father and I were sitting out on, on, on the terrace taking the sun when, when Charles announced that a man arrived insisting on talking to Father. I, I remember at the time, Father had many friends, but one look at this unannounced visitor would assure you that he was not one of them. It was a small, isn't man who approached Father with a shambling style of walk and a cringing manner. Uh, it's generous of you to see me, Governor. Once again. Once again, sir. I'm afraid I don't recall our previous meeting. If you'll refresh my memory. Don't you recognize me? Dear me. It is truly Mr. Hudson. All right you are. That'd be my name, sir. Good of you to recall. It's been so many years. Thirty-two, to be exact. Thirty-two years since we saw each other last. Yes, yes, of course. And here you are, sir, in your big house. And me, still picking salt meat out of a harness cast. Well, you'll find I've not forgotten old times, Hudson. You... I do look rather hard-pressed. I'm just off a two-year stint and an eight-knot tramp. And I could use a place to stay. I see. Well, we... I was to... sure after the hard days we shared on His Majesty's ship, the Gloria Scott, I could put up with either you or Mr. Beddoes. Beddoes. I was sure you'd recall him. Yes, yes. Well, of course you can stay here. We're in need of a gardener. I'd rather work inside the house, if it's all the same to you, sir. In the house? Yes, of course. Uh, Charles, take this man to the kitchen. Do then he gets food and drink. I'll be by later to explain his duties. And so that is how this man, Hudson, entered our lives. Oh, a cheeky sort of fellow, isn't he? Mm, yes, obvious from his brash manner that he felt on safe grounds. I believe you said he mentioned the Gloria Scott. Ah, uh, Gloria Scott. It seems I've heard that name somewhere. Undoubtedly, Watson, the fate of the bark Gloria Scott caused quite a stir in its day. As I recall... I see. The Gloria Scott left Falmouth on the 8th of October, 1853, sailed to her destruction in north latitude 15 degrees west, longitude 25 degrees, on November 6th of the same year. Oh, yes, yes, of course. The, the Crown believed the incident stemmed from a mutiny of some sort. But never proved, Watson. The mention of the Gloria Scott by Hudson had an hypnotic effect on Father. He did everything Hudson demanded. He soon elevated Hudson to the position of, of butler, replacing Charles in authority. Oh, and the man was drunk most of the time, difficult to deal with, lording it over the servants and insulting father's guests. And Sir James put up <laughs> boorish behavior. Well, not for long. 
One evening, he'd had enough, took the insolent cur by the nape of the neck and turned him out of the house. <laughs> Good for him. Well, we never heard from him again. Until the mention of his name in the message you intercepted. Yes. yes. Hmm. Now, why would the words headkeeper precede the name Hudson? Why, yes, of course. You, you have something, Hudson? I believe so, Watson. It is a code of some sort. I must admit, on first examination, I was quite baffled. Well, understandably, Holmes. About a hen pheasant's life. Well, well it was gibberish. <laughs> Simply gibberish. Well, of course, if the message was meant to convey that thought. But you've left out a number of key words, each of them very important to the final meaning. Well, I'm afraid I don't follow you. And just before dinner, I was examining the message again in my room. Uh, Holmes, I, I do hope you have it hidden away. I, I'd rather father no, didn't... No, 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 no. I've concealed the packet in my luggage, Victor. Since it was meant for your father, I'm sure he knows the code we are groping for. There's no need for the original. I have a copy of it right here. Words removed, phrases eliminated, letters superimposed. Good heavens. <laughs> you, you've tried just about everything, haven't you, Holmes? Yes, without success, as you can see. But now that we've ascertained that Hudson was merely a seaman, we can conclude that the first two words, headkeeper, have no meaning. Uh, possibly. Therefore, we merely underline every third word of the message, beginning with the word Hudson, thusly, and there we have it. You're right, Holmes. Yes. It, 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 it now makes sense. Yes, Watson. This message was obviously meant for Sir James. Only he would know the dark meaning behind this cryptic warning, which now reads, Hudson has told all, fly for your life. Good heavens. It came from upstairs. My room, I believe. Quick, Watson, follow me. If the cause of that gunshot is what I think it is, I'm afraid we are already too late. <laughs> Trevor Manor has always been a quiet, residential country estate. But in a very few minutes, that quiet is to be shattered by a shocking incident. One that will even baffle the master of the unexpected, Sherlock Holmes. We will share with Holmes the horror of a shocking discovery when we return shortly with Act Three. pyramids have forgotten their builders. Words, not stones, are the true monuments to the great. Listen then to the words of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a tribute to the man and his creation, the fabled detective, Sherlock Holmes. Within seconds after hearing the shot, Holmes raced for the stairs. Victor Trevor and I were not far behind. As we reached the head of the stairs, we could see Mrs. Henshaw, the Trevor housekeeper. It was she who had screamed at the sight of something in Holmes's room. We entered cautiously behind Holmes and were shocked to see the body of a man lying on the floor. Good Lord. It's Sir James. Father. Mm. Uh, your father is dead, Victor? By his own hand, I'm afraid. Oh, God. Shot through the temple. Telltale powder burns, gun still clutched in his right hand, and here, crumpled in his left hand. The slate's gray paper. Mm, despite our efforts to conceal it from him, he has finally seen and read the warning message. <sighs> Poor father. This man, Hudson, must certainly have had a terrible power over him. I wonder what ghastly secret they shared. Yeah. I fear we'll never know, Holmes. The secret, whatever it was, died with Sir James. No, I'm not so sure, Watson. Secrets have a way of turning up even after death. Whatever it was that haunted Sir James all these years could turn up even now. Tell me, Victor, do the words shambo deuce mean anything to you? Shambo deuce? Mm -hmm. Here, scrawled on the bottom of this page, I found it in your father's clenched hand. There are two words. Shambo and Deuce. I assume they go together and have some meaning. Yes, they do. Shambo Deuce is a rare vintage wine, a favorite of my father's. 
We keep a large cask of the brew in the wine cellar, but I fail to see... We'll look, we'll look at that in a moment, but first I think that we had best notify the police. Must we, Holmes? The scandal. I'm sure they will be discreet, but there will be questions. Yes, and so many we cannot answer. Not as yet. But while the police are on their way, we'll pay a visit to your father's wine cellar. I have a feeling that we'll find that cask of Chambeau Douce holds more than vintage wine. Steady with that candle, Watson. Ah, here's the door to the wine cellar. But the key is just above your head, Holmes. Uh, here, allow me. I haven't been down here in months. There we are. Now, if you gentlemen will step aside. Hmm. Uh, I must agree with you, Patel, when you say you haven't been down here in months. I don't believe anyone has. <laughs> Look at those ugly spider webs. Yes, right? but someone has been here not too long ago. See there. A recently broken web in the far corner. Well, that's where Father stores his keg of Chambeau Deuce. If you will lead the way, Watson. Uh, well, uh, there, there in the far corner, Doctor. Uh, we're, we're right behind you. Yes, yes. Well, it's a rather large cask. Quite old, I'd say. Yes, yes, and very interesting. A seagoing cask at that. You're quite right, Holmes. I, I never noticed. Bring the light a little closer, would you please? Mm. The cask is rather large. Large enough to contain a man's body, wouldn't you say, Watson? Good heavens, Holmes. You, you are not suggesting... No, 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 of course not, Watson. Merely making a passing observation. Oh, well, uh, I suppose anything is possible, Holmes, but, but I, I fail to see how one is able to stuff a man's body through a three-inch bunghole. Well, if you'll examine the structure of the barrel, you'll find it's quite sturdy. It's impenetrable. The seal hasn't been broken. Quite good, Watson, quite good. Actually, I did not expect to find anything in the cask, but perhaps behind it. Behind it? Mm, look at the floor, gentlemen. These track marks. This cask has been moved from time to time and returned to its original position. Why, you're right, Holmes. But how anyone without the strength of a Hercules is able to accomplish such a feat as beyond me. I've never seen it moved from this position, Holmes. There's something behind that cask that your father wants us to see. If you gentlemen will step aside. Uh, uh, here it is. A dust-free corner. At the top of the casing. I wager, if one were to apply pressure to this point... I say, it's moving. So it is, Watson... And what have we here? A small recessed compartment in the wall. The candle, if you please. Yeah. Your father took great pains to conceal whatever he has placed in here, Victor. Have you any idea what it could be? No, none at all. We have a wall safe in the house. All our valuables are kept in there. Both father and I have a key. Ah, but this, Victor, this was not meant for your eyes until now. A sealed oilskin packet. May I? Yes, yes, of course. Oh. It's rather sturdy, but with this pocket knife of mine, should... There. there we are. Well, what have we here? A um, book of some sort. <sighs> Almost destroyed with age and exposure to the elements. I say, it looks like a ship's log. That is exactly what it is, Watson. The log of the ill-fated bark, Gloria Scott. The one Hudson mentioned. I wonder how father... This may explain, Victor. A letter addressed to you. For my son, Victor Trevor. To be opened in the event of my death. Uh, read it, would you, Holmes? My hands are much too shaky. As you wish, Victor. My dear son, now that approaching disgrace begins to darken the closing years of my life, I must record the truth of my shame. Our family name, dear son, is not Trevor. Oh, I say. I was known as James Armitage in my younger years, years that brought shame and disgrace. For as Armitage, I entered a London banking house, and as Armitage, I was convicted of using bank funds for my own purpose. Good. The funds were used to pay a debt of honor 
but illegally come by. And so I soon found myself chained as a felon aboard the convict ship Gloria Scott, bound for Australia. The hold below deck was black as pitch, and the stench was more than one could bear. There were others like me who bore their miserable lot in silence, while some shouted their defiance to the high heavens. You can't keep us chained below decks forever! Back for every lash of the whip. I swear I will. Shh, the guards, they'll hear you. Huh? Who are you? My name's Armitage. James Armitage. Why, you're just a lad. What are you doing on this godforsaken convict ship? Penance, just as you are. Well, you won't be doing it for long. I'll be getting us all out of here, I will. How? You just leave it to me. My name is Hudson. Mark it well, lad. You'll learn to bless it before I am done with you. I murdered a man I did. <laughs> Even in this blackness, I can see you remember my case. My partner and I got away with over a million in cold hard cash. Yes, I've heard. The money was never found. Uh, where do you suppose it is, lad, eh? I'm sure I don't know, sir. <laughs> My partner, he's holding it for me. And where do you think he is? Right here on this ship. That's the devil's honest truth. He's topside. Respectable right. <laughs> He's the ship's chaplain, no less. <laughs> Satan himself, dressed as a man of God. Why, why so? We... <laughs> we worked it all out, lad. A way for him to come aboard with enough money to buy the crew. By now, this floating coffin is ours from... Kill the main truck. <laughs> and so, as Hudson had promised, all went as planned. One evening, about the third week, we had an unexpected visit from the ship's chaplain. He had come to give the last rites to a dying prisoner. And when he left, Hudson, freed of his chains, soon freed us all. We fought our way to the upper deck, and soon the roar of muskets were in our ears. The Hudson and the Sam Chaplin led the bloody mutiny. Believe me, my son, when I say there was never a slaughterhouse like that ship. The Chaplin was killed in the fight. Others were falling all around. Only three of us escaped the Holocaust. Hudson, myself, and a young seaman named Beddoes. Beddoes? I, I say, Holmes, wasn't that the man who... Yes, the one mentioned by Hudson the day he came to see Sir James. Go on, Holmes. Perhaps we'll learn more of Beddoes and this devil Hudson. As we pulled away from the Gloria Scott, Hudson, Beddoes, and I could hear the sounds of mutiny fade away. We could still see the faint outlines of the ship when suddenly, without warning, a cloud of black smoke shot up from her bow. And within moments, a great explosion blew her apart from stem to stern. Hudson, Beddoes, and I pulled for safety with all our strength, and as later recorded in maritime records, all hands were lost. Such in a few words, my dear lad, is the history of the terrible business in which I was involved as a youth. I am sure you can now understand the reason I had for changing my identity. As you know, I have since led a respectable life. Imagine then my feelings when, in the seaman who came to see us, I recognized instantly convict Hudson, the man who led the mutiny. Oh, dear. Chilling tale, indeed. Young Beddoes was a hired hand aboard ship and completely innocent of wrongdoing. 
Beddoes and I have been in touch with each other from time to time. I pray this confession will keep him safe. I say, of course. It was Beddoes who sent the warning to Sir James. Yes, Watson. Yes. I do hope this man Beddoes is safe and well. Fortunately, no one knows his identity. Uh, one man still does, Watson. A man I'm sure we have not heard the last of. A scoundrel named Hudson. As it turned out, Holmes was right. After a police investigation of Sir James's suicide, we returned to London. Holmes delivered the log of the Gloria Scott and the letter written by Sir James in hopes of clearing the seaman Beddoes of any charges. After reading the evidence, the court agreed to record Beddoes' innocence and seal all records against the possibility of public scandal. Well, some months went by, and Holmes had forgotten all about it when a reminder turned up in the post. I've just received a letter from Victor Trevor. Would you believe, Watson, he's in India? India? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yes. Says he sold the Trevor estate and is trying his hand at tea planting, of all things. Doing rather well at it. Well, good for him. Uh, strange case, the Gloria Scott. Yes. You know, I checked with the local police. No word on Hudson. And they haven't had any success in locating this man Beddoes. Both men seem to have vanished into thin air. Hmm, unusual, to say the least. I think it most probable that Beddoes, having heard of Sir James' demise, revenged himself upon Hudson and fled the country with as much money as he could lay his hands on. But Beddoes was a poor seaman, as was Hudson. Where would he get the money? From the sale of the Trevor estate. You mean he was given the money by Victor Trevor? Yes, Watson. A sympathetic ally whom he knew would say nothing, not even to his closest friends. And what better choice could Beddoes make than Victor Trevor? A young man who learned firsthand what it means to be haunted by the past. The case of the glorious Scott was an early one in the long and distinguished career of Sherlock Holmes. His creator, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dates the adventure for us, but the late H.W. Bell suggests it took place close on the heels of another fascinating adventure, the Musgrave Ritual. The writer of these unusual mysteries was quite prolific and had his favorite characters. One of them was the seaman Hudson, of whom we shall hear more when I return shortly. It was suggested that the seaman Hudson was at one time the husband of the fabled Mrs. Hudson, who was Holmes' housekeeper. This was denied by the feisty woman herself, who in the movie Mrs. Hudson Speaks says, I never saw that bad Hudson and never wanted to. My Hudson was a respectable tradesman, and he died when I was barely 25 years old. And so it seems, dear listeners, we have another mystery on our hands. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Court Benson, William Griffiths, and Paul Hecht. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.